the one to two percent cut in the in the current spending review cycle, uh, which local authorities are going to have addressing. So they're addressing a big rationalisation on their kind of stock at, stock at present. But they're looking at ways of how do they actually utilise their current facilities and future facilities in a better way, getting more people through that door. So that's an opportunity. We'll talk more about those later. Um, you've also got big changes in education, I was saying before. You've got, uh, you've got the movement from a lot of academies taking over schools, freeing themselves up from the local education sector. And lastly, of course, you've got the big one that's happening at the moment that's always there, the obesity challenge. Uh, you know, the direct costs to the NHS every year is about 5.1 billion in terms of obesity in this country. Uh, and a third of the children are now obese. So the challenge for us and the challenge for things like SPOGO is how do you get these people off their couch and doing more sport? And leading into this kind of digital sector in terms of SPOGO and the challenges we have, evidently there are some data challenges we have. So the Cabinet Office uh, last year, or in summer of last year, I launched a new open data white paper, very much saying that the public sector should open up more data for the private sector to use and work more with the private sector in terms of ensuring that the data they produce is actually usable by the private sector. So a clear steer uh, from the Cabinet Office. And one of the good things was that uh, SPOGO was actually included within that white paper as a kind of good example of where we've started to release the Active Places data. Um, but they're also, part of that is also they have a, you know, a transparency agenda in terms of you know, being, showing the public where, the, where pound for pound public sector money is being spent. And that's another challenge for us as we develop projects like this, showing where the value for money back to the taxpayer. We also have challenges ourselves. Evidently, as we say before, we work in this, in this increasing, um, we have a number of data projects we collect and we have to adjust again, what we're spending and justify what we're spending on. So, you know, we have our active people survey that is done every year in terms of measuring participation, and we also have our active places database, and we need to work smarter to reduce the costs on those. And, of course, we, we, are, we do have a new strategy that we, have, we launched last year, and we are looking for new ways that we can actually measure uh, participation and greater insight into how people are participating in sport and also measuring our national governing bodies. And so that's a, that's a challenge for us, but it's also an opportunity around the SPOGO project. And now I'm going to uh, introduce Charles Johnson, who's actually going to talk through the new strategy and talk a bit more about how we're meeting these challenges and talk, it, talk through how SPOGO fits into, into this. A good start. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it d doesn't give you a lot of hope, really, does it, for uh, for the sports sector when you look at those diagrams and you see the uh, the complication we're trying to deliver. And um, I think probably we couldn't have possibly launched this project a couple of years ago. I think the the combination actually of those cuts and the the changing environment and the the focus more on consumer now that we're getting with our national governing bodies uh, gives us this real opportunity that we didn't have before. So we've really got to uh, take this step, I think. And with technology coming along, that can give us a real um, boost here at the moment. So this can be a very cost-effective way, I think, of delivering increased participation in sport and get some real generation going through. Nick will show you some numbers later on, which shows you that this market, there's 15 million people a week playing sport in this country. And that's grown since we won the bid for the Olympics. That's grown by close to one and a half million. And 750,000 of those have grown in the last six months. So there's a big audience to go for. And that's only the people competing once a week for at least half an hour. So there's a there's a great number of people underneath that that don't measure against that statistic. So there's a real opportunity here, I think, for this to be part of a, a more joined-up landscape on how we can deliver sport for the future. A great complicated diagram. You're going to see quite a few of these today. But this is our investment of a, a billion pounds over the next four years into community sport. 70% of that is lottery, so whilst you keep buying your rollover tickets and uh, the Euro millions kick in, that money is flowing directly into sport, so thank God for that. So uh, 
We'll all rush out tonight and buy one extra ticket and that money will go into sport. We've just announced, as Nick said, over 400 million of investment across 46 sports for the next four years. So there's a real revenue stream there that we've got to focus to really generate increased participation in their sports. They all have targets. We're talking payment for results. So um, as the government is saying to us, if people aren't delivering, then we'll take that money back and we'll look elsewhere. But that determination is to spend that money across those sports to increase participation. And we've seen the successful sports in there really know their consumer now. So when you look at cycling, you look at netball, uh, you look at running, their products have moved to really reflect what their consumers are telling them. More informal sport, less organised, more spontaneous, um, working through friends rather than necessarily through clubs. And that's where they're getting that growth in, in participation. So the more that we can offer um, choice and the more we can offer consumer-focused, demand-led products, the more we're going to get people playing sport in this country. We've got the school sport games, top left-hand corner. That's all about linking. So we've got formal sport within the curriculum. We want those people to have competition. And we want to grow the links between where sport is almost organised for you within school up to where you have to organise it for yourself within the community. So we want the community to reach through. We've got um, initiatives like satellite clubs that will bridge that gap between organised for you and organising yourself within that community sport facility. Um, as property director, I'm very pleased to say a quarter of our budget is going into facilities. Um, that keeps a number of us in business. Um, but there are very targeted investment so that we're looking at a process of rationalisation of stock a lot of um, local authority stock is not designed strategically. It was designed politically. People thought there were votes in swimming pools, so they built a swimming pool. It was never the right place, never the right blend of facilities, and it's struggling from revenue point of view. So there's a real opportunity to look again and to put, with the results from active people, active places, to have a demand-led strategy for facilities which will save those local authorities 30 and 40% of their running costs, but will give their consumers a much better product suited to what their demands are. So there's a real opportunity there. Again, we wouldn't have that opportunity if we weren't in the recession and if people weren't looking at 30 or 40% cuts. You can't make those sorts of cuts by closing an hour early and turning one degree down on your swimming pool temperature. You've got to do something radical. And then we've got the local investment. Uh, the feedback we had from when we talked to people on our strategy was very much that it's not reaching down lo locally enough and we need people to work locally. So we're, we've put a substantial amount of our future investment into bringing people together in that local environment to make sure that the governing bodies are reaching into the right communities and that they are working with the local authorities who don't work, want to work necessarily over 46 sports. The modelling that we get from active people will say where the demand hotspots are and where that latent demand is, that's where we want to focus our investment. We can't possibly give a blanket cover right across the country, so we've really got to be led by the consumer. And I think that's language that you wouldn't have heard from Sport England in an organisation like this um, two or three years ago. And we're seeing that very successfully with the governing bodies. Um, we're seeing where they are successful. We'll hear from Alex in a minute on that consumer focus. Um, Alex, I think you'll probably be talking about a few of your new products. So those are really coming from what the consumer is saying. Um, I haven't got time for traditional sport. Um, I haven't got the resources for that. I want something quick, spontaneous, more informal. And we can provide that through this network. So we're looking to grow once a week um, participation. We're particularly targeting that 14 to 25, the youth, and we're particu particularly trying to manage that transition between um, school and community sport. Um, we want that, even though those numbers are going up, this 14 to 25-year-old group is not going up. But we think with social media, um, there's a real opportunity to interact in the way they want to be um, uh, communicated with. And turning up, you know, 
If you're offering them football, it's always two o'clock, it's on a Saturday, you train Tuesday night and that's the end of it, then their, their vote for that is I'm not going to play that sport. So we've got to have something that really communicates with them and works in the environment using the communication medium that those people are talking to. And that will address the drop-off where we're losing significant numbers of people between uh, school and university, school and further education, further education and work. If we can build this sporting habit and we can have them that established, then that will, that will bridge that gap and that will keep them going so that they feel part of community sport before they leave the organised um, environment of education. And we really need to target people with disabilities and we really need to grow the talent pathway so that we've got a, a better pool of people feeding in to the elite um, that uh, UK sport focus. So we can uh, rise to that challenge of even more medals for, for Rio when it's not a home games. And that will be the first time that everybody, anybody can have achieved that. So SPOGO is very important to us to, to gather data um, and to get that consumer insight. Up to now, sport has been very supply focused, very traditional. Um, we talk a lot about the sort of blazer brigade where, where county structures have organised sport in a traditional way. People have worked really hard to get, their, get on that county committee and the last thing they want is Sport England to undermine that position and say, actually you don't need to play sport you know, in the way you've played it. We can play it in the leisure centre on a Thursday evening. So we've got to be able to influence and say, if you are declining in a certain sport, what is our consumer data telling us? How can we facilitate you playing in the way you want to play more easily? And how can we design new products and services to match the demand that the market's telling us? We can then feed that back out into our key investments so that when we are investing in sport, we're investing in some way that we know is what the consumer wants and we're likely to get a good return on that investment, not only for ourselves but our partners across that very fragmented um, delivery system that uh, Nick spoke about. So the priority really targets for SPOGO. We really want to start with people that are interested in sport. We hear a lot of talk about getting people off the, off the couch and, and into sport, and undoubtedly some of this will come from that. But to begin with, there are a lot of people that are floating about in the system where it just becomes a bit too difficult and they give up and they go to the cinema or they just go back to the, back to the sofa. So we want the, to release that latent demand that we see through active people where people want to get on and they want to play sport but it just becomes a bit too difficult. I don't know where to start. I don't know who to go to. Um, we, we talk anecdotally about it's more difficult to book a badminton court than it is to book a holiday for four in Lanzarote, for instance. So we want to get them interested and make the barriers to their consumption of sport um, as, as limited as possible. So if they are interested, if they've done their Google search or whatever it is, we keep them hooked now, we give them opportunity, we keep them on the line until they press that online booking. And that's why the, the pilot for SPOGO is so important. We can do those links and we can see that feedback and we can see that change in consumption um, as far as that's concerned. And this is more for the informal people. If you're in a club and you're in there... Um, organized every week, then you probably don't need this same level of intervention because it's repetitive. You know that I go to my session every Thursday evening. You know, uh, those of, I was talking to somebody earlier today and they're saying that um, their Zumba class organizer is like a Rottweiler. She won't let you off the hook because she knows her livelihood depends on you turning up week after week. But she's communicating through a very stagnant audience of, of this lady, her sister, friends, the people that read the notice board on the, um, on the village hall. If we can give her a portal so she can connect through our system, we can open her up to a huge great market and then she doesn't, possibly doesn't need to be quite as Rottweiler-ish as she is now. But for people where it's organised, they're in the system, they're a regular participant, um, they're less necessary probably than the people that uh, are on the fringes that are not getting to that once a week target. So that's where we want to we want to target at the start of it, but we want it to be usable by all, we want it to grow into the into the place to go and the portal for everybody. 
So the research has told us that um, if we made it easier, people would do a lot more sport. It is these barriers. There's a good reasons to excuses to give up on sport. So we want to make sure that, uh, that we overcome those. And heavily fragmented, as you saw by that diagram, is certainly one of it. You know, when you look at other sectors, you look at retail sector, for instance, there's half a dozen big players organising the market for you. You don't need to go beyond that environment. When we're looking at an environment of 350 local authorities, 46 governing bodies of sport that we fund, all the different agencies, um, all the different operators, 5,000 leisure centres around the country, it's no wonder that market is fragmented. And all that level of data is at a very different, um, different position. Probably in this room, we're all probably sitting in half a dozen different databases, and yet we're the same person. How can we get to the point where that becomes um, much more organised for us, those barriers are reduced, much more accessible quality, as we say on this slide. So it's important that we drive the data, and our initiative to make our active places data open source to everybody is starting to do this. But if we can get that consumer data feeding back, we'll take a step change in this sector, in our knowledge and insight to the consumer habits that we've got. And I think that will be very significant and a really good legacy from the Olympics, I think. So we've got to work at building these, removing these barriers, taking the excuses away, particularly New Year, where we've all resolved to play more sport. Coming up in the lift, there was a guy that was uh, looking very hot and sweaty, having come from the Virgin Gym down below, and he said it's packed out and it will be for another couple of weeks. We want it to be for another 12 months, really, until the next year. So we want to prove the concept with the pilot. So we say to everybody, we know it's working, we know it's making a change, we know we're addressing these issues and these barriers, and we can scale this up right across this fragmented community. So we want to prove the concept of online booking. We want to get it much less focused than we've got at the moment. Best practice is out there. Um, I was talking again to a lady yesterday who booked her squash court online in Sutton. But in other people, I went to a, a county recently and looked at their leisure facility, and there next to the phone is the diary where they write it in. And they, di they didn't even have um, county-wide charging policy. So if they phoned up that lady and the diary was in and they hadn't crossed out the booking, you missed an opportunity. And if you all were booked up, they didn't then passport that to say, no, I'm booked, but our leisure centre two miles down the road is available. Would you like me to passport that opportunity to you? All those opportunities were lost. So if somebody phoned up for that squash court and it was booked, they didn't play sport. And we want to make sure that they don't have those excuses not to, um, not to continue to play sport. So it's all about data. It's all about driving innovation. It is about a legacy from London 12. We talk, talk a lot about... Uh, a digital legacy and uh, a number of, in, of us in this room have spent the morning trying to secure the digital legacy from LOCOG with their, their database that is um, reputed to be five million people all interested in sport. That combined with SPOGO can give us a huge opportunity to really engage with a, with a huge audience for the future that are all really focused on, on the sporting opportunities that we offer them. So this is a hugely complicated slide, um, but uh, I think you're going to see quite a few of those today. But this is our refined vision for this journey. Um, you might say slightly blurred, but we'd say refined. So uh, I'll read you through it to, to carry on. So it's, it's very much providing this one-stop shop. If you're looking at sport, we want this to be the first port of call. And hopefully the only port of call because it can navigate people right through their journey until they're participating. We want people to feed back, which will drive the quality standards. We want them to be able to find that place to play and to book it, whether it's a leisure centre, whether it's a swimming session, whether it's that Zumba class or that squash court or whatever it might be. We can put traffic to those independent places. With that fragmented market, there's a lot of people that are delivering sport that are sort of sole practitioners you know, working out of a suitcase in the back of their car, we want to link them into this wide market as well. So we want to target initially people interested in sport. Um, we want to give them 
a good experience. And we want to tell them to tell us when it was good. We want them to tell us when it was bad because that's going to drive the providers of sport to be better. If they're losing customers because they're bad at delivering what they want, um, as we see with Top Table, as we see with a number of the other sites, that feedback is there and online and that drives their quality and drives their, um, their product development as well and we want that as well. So we want to engage right across the spectre of sports participation and bring all of that, that fragmented um, delivery chain that you saw all together under the umbrella of this, um, of this system. Um, we can provide the end user insight because as soon as we're capturing this activity we start to get patterns of consumption and we can see what changes, we can see where interventions make a difference and then we can start to develop further the products and services that we know the market will want. So we believe when you're looking at that traffic this is a very financially sustainable model. When we're looking at the numbers we're talking about, 15 million now, um, 18 million people that play sport once a month, but 24 million people that play sport not at all. And if we can then use this pro product as well to drive the cost effectiveness of sport into those other sectors that Nick was talking about, so it's a cost effective intervention for health and dieting, it's a cost effective intervention um, for social inclusion, then we can drive still more traffic and more investment into sport. So we're, we're doing this for strong reasons, really. We think that this is a very good return on our investment. We think this is a very good opportunity to get cost-effective growth in participation in sport. And it's the right time to be doing this now where people are looking for more radical and innovative solutions to overcome those, um, those cost challenges that are out there every day. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. I now uh, introduce Richard Peary from uh, the SPOGO team, who's now going to talk you through uh, the pilot project.